The Lord be with you. As you're turning in your Bibles this morning, not to 1 Corinthians, but rather to the first chapter of Mark, uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. I've thrown a bit of a curveball this morning. Uh, as you're turning there, be sure also to cast your vote for who wore it best. Was it me, the preacher, or Pat? One of us. I mean, I wore a tie, just to put that out there so I know. We're starting a new, a new quartet. We're called the Blue Suits. So, you know. um, Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 21, <clears throat> reading through verse 28 this morning. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, God, may we hear what you would have us to hear, that we may do what you call us to do, that, O oh God, we may be the people you are calling us to be. In Christ's holy name we pray, amen. I remember you could smell him before he even came to the door. I was sitting in my office, and that odd smell that if you smelled it once, you know it, smells sort of like burnt cat urine. I smelled it down the hall, even through the steel door that went into the, the office suite there. And then the bell rang. I went to the door and opened it, and there was a man, about six foot six maybe. He had a white straw hat on, holding it in his hand, thin unusually thin, and covered with sores. Meth bugs is what they call them. He came into the hallway, and he sat down in the office. He needed some help. He was staying at a hotel that was not far from our church at the time. He needed some help. He needed some money. He needed some gas. He needed some food. He needed something. And we kind of went through the rigmarole of what we did when someone came. It was a form. We usually gave them a card to somewhere. And he told us thank you. And he left, but his smell lingered. <coughs> I remember one of the people who were in the office that morning said to me, I wish these folks would have the decency to take a bath before they came here. They get cleaned up a little bit before they walked in the door looking for help. I mean, at least think enough of yourself to get cleaned up. It didn't surprise me at all that that man or anybody else like him ever set foot back in that church again. He came looking for help, for liberation from an illness that clouded his mind, for love from those who claimed to love everybody. There was a church sign out front that said, all are welcome. He was looking for acceptance from those who were really just as broken and messed up as he was. He just wanted somebody to say that you're not alone in all of this. We don't care what you smell like. We don't care what you look like. That there was something more powerful than the oppression of fear and rejection of his addiction 
Yet all he got was more of the same. Here's your help, now go away until you can come back clean. Except this time, it just was wearing its Sunday best. He was looking for freedom from the chains that bound him of illness, addiction, loneliness. Freedom from the so-called authorities of this world that tell us how to think and how to act. But instead, he just got another dose of this new authority with a clever disguise of God language. And he wasn't the first, and he probably wouldn't be the last. But he came, got what we gave him, and never came back. Of course, it could have gone differently, I I suppose. It could have gone more like this meeting at Capernaum some 2,000 years ago, where Jesus, fresh from his bout with Satan in the wilderness, right after calling these disciples who were anything but good church folks, he was teaching in the synagogue there. That's what you do. Some of you maybe have been parts of little small churches, small synagogues in ancient Galilee. Preacher's not there, maybe don't have one. New guy comes through. Well, we got to have somebody bring a sermon. There was Jesus. And the congregation, we're told, was astounded at his teaching. Really liked it. Man, he must have really knew how to shuck the corn. And just then, in the middle of it, right in the middle of the service, maybe during the invitation, there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Now, folks, you know as well as I do that nothing can throw a wrench in the gears of a good church service like some obnoxious distraction. You know, like somebody's cell phone ringing or the preacher's kid talking while somebody's trying to pray. Nothing can throw a wrench in a good service like that sort of distraction. And I'm sure that's what many folks thought there in the synagogue at Capernaum. Shut that fella up. We're trying to have a good church service here. We're trying to get through this and get to lunch. It's raining outside and we want to go home and take a nap. Get him to hush so it don't go too long. That's what they were doing. That's what this man was for them, a distraction. But the truth is, he had no right to be there. No, no right whatsoever. He was a man, we're told, with an unclean spirit. Whether this refers to demonic possession, though the word demon, damion, is not mentioned at all in this passage. Whether it's a mental illness, whether it's something else entirely, is really irrelevant. The, The man is unclean. He has an unclean spirit, which means he is not allowed to be in the presence of the people of God. He's not allowed to gather with others in the synagogue. So maybe, how did he get in there? I don't know. Perhaps he had successfully kept his uncleanness hidden. Maybe he wore a a, a robe and sat and cowered in the back corner quiet when the offering plate went by, just sort of passed it down, didn't make any eye contact. Maybe he heard the new preacher was there, wanted to see if he'd notice. He doesn't know me. He doesn't know I don't belong. Let's see if he can figure it out. I don't know. Mark doesn't give us a lot of details. All that Mark does is usually really quick and and with very little exposition. Just here's this, here's this. And now here is this man offering to throw the whole service off track. And the unclean spirit within him cries out, at Jesus, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. You can hear it, can't you? The Holy One, who you think you are. Now, if this had been me, and I'm just telling you this in case any of you think you got an unclean spirit. If it had been me, I might have taken the coat off, rolled my sleeves up and said, you want to go one? Let's go. Unclean spirit? Jesus, who do I think I am? I'll show you. But Jesus doesn't do it. Jesus doesn't doesn't get ready for a fight. He doesn't even go all, all Benny Hinn on him either. He doesn't break out the anointing oil. He's not ready to lay his hands on him. He doesn't begin to, to speak some incantation. He doesn't prick out his, his prayer book or his Bible and begin to say, Ah, oh, thus say it's right here. Ah, oh, you know, the power of Christ compelled. No, none of that. Jesus, in really just a sort of -of matter-of-fact way, rebukes the Spirit. Hush. That's my translation. Hush. 
come out of him. Hush, be quiet. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him, crying with a loud voice, came out of him. Jesus showed his authority over this unclean spirit, over those things which are beyond our control and comprehension, things which our modern minds just don't buy some of the time. And in doing so, he gives this unmanned name, unnamed man a new life. No longer is he just the man with an unclean spirit. Now he's a new man. No longer is he ruled by the authority of this, this unclean spirit, these spirits that dwell within him. But now he has come face to face with the ultimate authority that rests in the Son of God. And that's all we get about the man. There's no follow-up. Jesus doesn't pick him up off the ground and say, okay, come by my office in three months' time. We'll take a scan, make sure the unclean spirit is gone. No, there's no follow-up. The disciples don't say, Jesus, should we tag him, follow him around, see what happens? No. But we're told in verses 27 and 28 that everybody there in the synagogue were all amazed. And they kept saying to one another, what's this? What is this? A new teaching. With authority, which implies that the other ones didn't have it. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And at once, Mark says, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the thing in Mark that gets Jesus' name really going. He kicks off his public ministry with a bang. His fame begins to spread all throughout the region of the Galilee as those in Capernaum witnessed what Jesus had done with this man, with the unclean spirit. And I have to tell you, it's a really good story, isn't it? It's a great testimony, we say. A man who was once tormented by an unclean spirit, a man who was once found under the influence of a false authority, a man who was once enslaved to a power that was simultaneously outside and inside of himself, a man, as the song says, who was once blind but now can see, who was once lost but is now found. That's a good story. That's the kind of story I can get behind. It's the kind of story... We like to tell. It's the kind of story we like to share with other people. I knew a man who was addicted and then he went to church and heard a sermon and found Jesus and now he's teaching Sunday school. Amen, praise God, right? It's the kind of story we like to tell. It's not really the kind of story, though, that I think we like to live. See, like those first witnesses at the synagogue in Capernaum, many of us uh, are anxious to hear these new things, exciting teachings, things from the Bible. We're, we're excited about telling the grand stories about how Jesus saved somebody from an unclean spirit, a life of crime, of fornication, drugs, evil, and sin. But when it gets down to it, and we have to be a part of that story, well... I kind of lose my excitement a little bit. There are those of us who find ourselves, I think at times, standing on the other side of a decision, on the other side of the baptismal pool maybe, and believe, whether we like to admit it or not, that we no longer need Jesus. After all, what's Jesus for if not to get into heaven, right? What's Jesus for if not to take us from one side to the other? We don't need Jesus anymore to exercise those unclean spirits that pollute our lives and cloud our conscience. We'd much rather witness that in the lives of others. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I got Jesus now. I want to see somebody else get Jesus. Those others we call unbelievers of sinners, reprobates. We'd rather watch it unfold in the lives of others, to watch as the love and forgiveness of Christ becomes real in their lives. All the while, we think, well, that's good. That's what they need. They need Jesus, not me. We love to tell those stories. But we're not so anxious to be those stories. We're quick to point out the need for Jesus' authority in the lives of others, but not so quick 
to confess that our lives aren't always steered by the presence of Christ within ourselves. In other words, it seems to me that some of us are always ready and willing to call out the unclean spirits in others, to sit in the pews at the synagogue at Capernaum and go, that man needs Jesus. To tell the stories of how someone else has to be liberated from a sinful life because I was too fortunate and I don't have to lead it. But when it comes to acknowledging that there are blind spots in our own lives, places where we've yet to say, all right, Jesus, it's yours. We're not so ready to confess that, I think. It's as if we have some kind of diet, sugar-free, low-calorie, fat-free sort of faith. All the salvation you want and none of the surrender, none of the commitment. So I wonder about myself, about maybe you. Do we really believe that Jesus has the authority to be Lord of our lives, our whole lives? Do we really believe that Jesus still has the authority even now, even on the other side of baptism, that Jesus still has the authority to forgive even our darkest, most secret sins? Do we really believe that Jesus has power over those things that are beyond our control and outside of our understanding? Do we really believe that Christ has that sort of authority, that sort of power, still in our lives? I wonder. I wonder sometimes if we still believe that Jesus has the power and authority to change the very world in which we live right now our very lives in an instant. Not just about where are we going to wind up when we die, but change our lives right now. I wonder if we're ready to confess that we still have places in our own hearts that we've yet to fully give over to Christ's authority and power. I wonder sometimes if church folks aren't just sometimes a bunch of folks who want to tell others stories to make Jesus famous by sharing stories of how he's changed other people. Because after all, we don't need any changing, right? Or are we ready to confess that every one of us, from the preacher standing up here to the person sitting next to you in the pew and even the one sitting right there in you in the pew, are we ready to confess that we are all still in need of Christ's love each and every day. That it's not just some ticket to ride. That we need to let go more and more of ourselves. That we may be changed more and more by Christ and his love. The people said, what is this? And I wonder, what is this power that Jesus has? Is it the power to make the unclean clean? Is it the power to bring the addicted out of their own darkness? Is it the power to turn the lives of nasty, unfit folks into something nicer? Is it the power to get folks into heaven? Well, yeah. But it's so much more. It's the same sort of power that can save good, clean church folks like you and me each and every day. What is this? I pray God shows it to you today. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us, Lord, when Lord, when we like to tell the stories of others' need for you and pretend as if we don't need you to. Make us mindful each day with each breath we take, God, that we need you. We need you to bring light into the dark 
power in our weakness, love in our fear, to show the way through our ignorance. God, even when we think we have it all figured out, remind us, God, that we still need you to show us the way. We praise you, Lord, for those times in our lives, those stories of unclean spirits cast out, of addicts who recover, of those who are on the brink of death brought back to life. But God, we also praise you for those small mercies every day that call us closer to you. So Holy God, speak to us now in this time. Move in our presence. May your spirit call us and shape us. We pray in your holy name.